How can tenants who have lost their income source due to the global pandemic maintain their homes and pay rent? And it's more than jobs being lost. Bread earners are down with a virus and can't work. Many have passed away. My first guests who got their hands and heads full are from the Flatbush Tenant Coalition here in Brooklyn. Also in this program, a student from Campa Charter School will be talking to a lot to write on host of Young Academic Achievers, and I'll be talking with the author of this book, Divided by Design. But let me begin with our guests from the Flatbush Tenant Coalition, Aga Trojnak and uh, Paulette James. Welcome to Brooklyn 45. Thank you. Happy to be here. Not everyone is protected under this moratorium. Aga, this question is for you. What about those residential tenants living in non-regulated units? Yeah, so, you know, in fact, right now there is no eviction moratorium. Uh, the, the real moratorium ended on October 1st. And um, what, what is in place right now are, uh, it's sort of a mishmash of different things. Um, there are a lot of tenants who are not protected um, especially, uh, you know, folks who might have non-traditional jobs, um, you know, lots of, uh, lots of people who are just not covered by either uh, the Safe Harbor Act at the state level or the C CDC moratorium um, at the federal level. And evictions are happening across New York State, in New York City, um, you know, and upstate as we speak. Um, so I think that's the first important thing to recognize is that there is no moratorium and, you know, tenant groups across um, the state uh, through the Right to Counsel Coalition and Housing Justice for All um, are fighting for a real eviction moratorium. There's a bill uh, in the um, Senate and the Assembly um, that, uh, that is a real, uh, would be a real eviction moratorium and we're pushing um, we're pushing for that because too many families are hurting um, across the state, across the country, um, and to have to worry about whether you're going to have a roof over your head during a pandemic um, is, is unconscionable um, to put people in that, in that situation. Of course. But tenants are getting notices from landlords, and these notices appear to be eviction notices. What do you tell them? Yeah, so, you know, landlords are, the courts are, are open. Uh, the, the physical spaces might not be open, but the courts um, are proceeding virtually um, with cases. So when somebody reaches out to us and they have received a notice from their landlord, um, you know, we always advise folks um, to number one, reach out to an attorney and I can, um, you know, provide a number where people can uh, reach out to an attorney um, to get some legal advice. Um, you know, across the city, there is a right to counsel. So in, in housing court, so every tenant has a right to counsel. Uh, it is no longer by zip code. It used to be rolled out by zip code, but the city has committed to um, just providing it across the board, across the city to every tenant. Um, so tenants can receive that assistance. The number to call is 718-557-1377. So it's 718-557-1379. And then the next thing we tell folks is to organize, to talk to their neighbors, see how many people in their building are experiencing the same uh, thing that they are, because this is a lot of people. Um, and they can reach out to organizations like us or other organizations to help organize a tenant association and join the fight for the eviction moratorium. I'm sure Paulette, you are very involved in this kind of outreach. Uh, tell us a bit about what you are doing. Well, I try to talk to my neighbors. Well, first, thank you for having me on. I try to talk to my neighbors and to console them as we are, uh, all of us are in the same situation. Now, my 
thing is about the cancel rent. If I may speak about that. Yes, go ahead. Yes, cancel rent because if our rents are not canceled, what would happen to us? Because we cannot pay a rent. What would happen if we get, even if we get a deal to pay the rent and would have a one shot deal to pay that back? No, it would be a hole in a hole. So we cannot take a one shot deal. Now, if we cannot pay the rent and be evicted and be thrown on the street, now, what would happen about COVID when the governors are saying, keep in, don't, we don't want people to go out on the street to spread the virus. Now, you cannot go to, to your relatives, friends, or anybody to, to say, well, you would stay with them until you can get yourself together. You don't have a job. The situation is very troutic. And if no, the government and those who are in charge to see that we are provided with, with money, with funds to pay our rent or to cancel that rent, like for instance, if you have a house, a home, you would have an insurance for these situations. So apparently nobody was prepared. It came sudden on us. And all we want is to ask and even go to beg, please cancel our rent to set us at ease and we be in a comfortable house and not to go out there to spread the COVID and make and it spread worse. the COVID. Yes, yes indeed. Aga, um, can you speak about the Tenant and Safe Harbor Act? Yes. Um, so we actually refer to that as the De uh, Tenant Debt Collection Act. Um, so that is an act that, um, although it protects a small number um, of tenants from evictions, it does not protect everybody. There are many people who uh, will still be subject to eviction under that act. Yeah. Um, and in addition, the act actually stipulates that that landlords can continue eviction proceedings and that judges can issue monetary judgments against tenants. So what that means is that tenants um, will have a debt that is then collectible through, you know, people garnishing wages when folks have wages again, things of that sort. So it doesn't protect uh, people and it actually puts people in debt, actively puts people in debt. Um, you know, that is not a solution. Uh, we, need, uh, we need a real eviction moratorium like the, the bill that was introduced by Senator Myrie and Assembly Member Reyes. Um, and we need, as Paulette said, we need rent to be canceled. Um, that is, those are really the only solutions to this uh, problem. Otherwise, we're just dragging this out and the incredible anxiety and stress and hardship that this is creating uh, on top of everything else is, um, is really unconscionable, as I said. Aga Chorzniak from the Flatbush Tenant Coalition and uh, Paulette James, we really appreciate the work that you are doing on behalf of tenants. Uh, they need you. Uh, and. Uh, they are appreciative, I'm very sure, about the, appreciative of the work that you're doing. Thank you very much for being our guest here on Brooklyn 45. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And now let's go to Alonta right on. Joining us today is Rubea Rahman an eighth grade student at Campa Charter School, representing East New York, Brooklyn. Welcome to Brooklyn 45, Rubea. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. As a Campa student, your principal, Mr. George Leonard, recommended you as our young academic achiever. 
talk to us about your classes and what's extra special about the classes that you're taking. The classes that I take are very special because all the teachers put extra care and work into what they do and the students put just as much work and everyone is like family so everything that we do always is so special especially with it being my last year. Mm, a senior. So what are the classes that you're taking? You're taking some pretty special classes as a middle school student. I am. I'm taking Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Health, Physics, ELA, and that's it. Um, all, most of my classes are Regents courses to prepare me for high school and what's beyond that. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be sitting for Regents level courses should the state, the state decide to administer the Regents this year, correct? Yes. How do you feel about that? It's exciting and at the same time nerve wracking. <laughs> of course, I'm sure. Regents are not, are not easy. So out of all the classes that you've taken, which are your favorite and why are they your favorite? I'd have to say if I were to choose physics and health, because when I grew up, I would like to be a physician and cardiologist, just like my grandfather. Okay, grandfather a cardiologist, but and why would you want to pursue that besides your grandfather being one? It was my mother's dream once and she passed mm -hmm. it on and I'd love to help people. Mm -hmm. That's an important field. Yes, it is because <laughs> some people don't have as much as others and I'd like to give them what they deserve. Okay, so what are you passionate about? I'm passionate about writing, reading, and helping others. Okay, say more about that. Um, writing has always been a um, place that I go to when I need to let go. Mm -hmm. Reading was always there, and it's always given me another perspective. And helping others is always so fulfilling, and it makes me happy when to see others that I love happy. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So you stated also that you are currently 100% remote learning. So I'd like you to share your strategy for academic success and what words of wisdom can you share with other students navigating remote and hybrid learning this school year? I think not procrastinating, focusing, mm -hmm. And um, when you do, when you're doing well, not lack off, because I know from personal experience, it can really hurt your grades when you get overly confident. Rebea, you talked about mental health. Talk to us more about that. I believe mental health is a thing and people should put more time and effort into it rather than putting it off because our brain is our biggest advantage if we use it correctly and more people need to realize that and put more effort into making sure their mental health is okay and then go on to do everything that they love and need to do. And why are you so passionate about that? Because growing up the people around me didn't focus on mental health and I know personally how much that can make you crash at the end of the day so I during quarantine especially I have focused on my mental health and it has increased positivity and productiveness by a lot. Can I ask how you've done that? I put off everything for at least a few minutes or like an hour a day and I sit to myself and I think and I make sure that I'm thankful and not taking anything for granted and I know what I have to do and I plan everything and then I go on to do it because I know me better than I know anyone else and I'd like to make sure I'm okay and put myself first before I do anyone else. I love it. I love her. You're so smart. Thank you. <laughs> so 
Rabea, thank you for joining us today. We wish you much success this school year and beyond. Keep in touch so that we may follow your successes, okay? All right. Be well. Thank you. I am Alanta Rydon. Back to you, Sam. Thank you, Alanta. My next guest is from that island that's often called Gem of the Caribbean. And we'll be discussing his book, Divided by Design. Joining me to discuss this book is the author, Rodney Lewis. Rodney, welcome to Brooklyn 45. Thank you so very much, Sam. How are you doing today? Good. I'm curious about this title. Why? Um, divided. The mm -hmm. title Divided is so self propagating and it continues right, to keep us separated as a people. All right? So um, when I chose to call it Divided by Design, I said because it's so uh, impactful, right, um, that, you know, it was very specific what they did to us. And I studied with Lynch, although a lot of historians um, would argue that the accounts weren't necessarily um, true. So what I chose to do in the book is not necessarily say that he did it so easy or anything, but it made him a normal plantation owner having a discussion with another plantation owner and showing the level of divisiveness um, that he would have instilled among our people. Yeah. So this is historical as opposed to what is happening right now. Yeah, historical fiction. Actually, there's a blend. Um, the first part of it is more historical. The other part in the book, um, the second part of the book is really what is going on at this present point in time. So okay. I literally went through a couple of years to show the first slavery era, and then they brought it into the present time. Why did you really decide to write this book? I, I, know, you, I know you are not an author by profession, mm -hmm. although you are a professor by profession, among the many other things that you do professionally. But why did you really decide to write this book? Well, one correction, I'm not necessarily a professor by profession. Um, I conducted a couple classes at the University of the West Indies as a co-lecturer, right? Um, yes. But one of the reasons why I wrote the book, if I be very um, honest, is that in my black skin, I thought I knew everything about being black. I would be very humble to say that, you know, uh, when I found out that as melanin saturated as I am, I really didn't know anything. And persons of the other races, they actually knew more than I did, right? And because I was black, or I am black, I didn't necessarily want to hear anything else. So when new information came to me, I sort of like put up a wall against it. And it's only really in my 40s, right, that I started to really appreciate blackness, the struggle, you understand? And I, I, only, I only thought of us being captured and brought here by slave ships and everything else, but I had no real appreciation for like, you know, all of our, the wealth of education, the wealth of knowledge, right? Everything else that we had to offer as a people. And I definitely wanted to, you know, share my views. And I believe that if I had remained silent with an issue that is so serious, I would also be complicit. Where can we find your book? Um, this book is, yes. um, at, is at the University of the West Indies in Barbados at the bookshop. Um, it's going to be also at Black Dot Cultural Center. Um, you can find the book online as well, um, where are divided by design on our Instagram and our Facebook pages and stuff as well. Um, those are some of the places you can find the book. You talk about the struggle for racial equality. And even when you look at your book, we, we see the inequality starkly demonstrated here. Um, but why is that struggle still prevalent today? That struggle is still prevalent because one of the things, a byproduct of slavery was or is poverty. And if you look at poverty, right, um, 
there are so many things that would have stemmed or stem from poverty, you know, poor health, um, crime, all of those things. And we, as a black people, um, seem to start from, the, from behind all of the time. And persons were able to use land that they gained by whatever means um, to give them the advantage that they do have now and use it as collateral to continue you know, advancing their causes. And in a sense, you'll find that we are still continuing in the same mold that was before us in terms of you know, the, the, the economic divide. And one of those, and that, that for me stands out a lot. Why as a Bajan, you feel you should be concerned about what is happening now because lots of people, not, and I'm just not talking only about Barbadians, um, but lots of black people, uh, we, we don't seem to be very concerned about our past. So why as a Bajan do you think you should be concerned and other Bajans and other black people, whatever part of the world they're from, should be concerned? Well, one of the reasons why I definitely feel like I should be concerned as a Bajan is because I have two sons and a daughter. And once you travel, this is no longer a Bajan thing versus a USA thing or a UK thing, because as you migrate, the things that happen in the States could easily have happened to myself if I were in the States at the time. The things that happened to George Floyd, I could have been the person that was on the street. And because I travel a lot, it could have happened to me. I have family and friends overseas. And, you know, so I had to get and realize, you know, that this is no longer a Bajan or a USA thing, right? It is a black people thing. Yeah. You, you say um, that there are readers who may find a few of the passages extremely graphic in nature. What are some of those passages that are very graphic? Well, when one of the main characters, he was caught, he actually was caught by one of his own people. And they want us to understand that we play the role in capturing our own people. And when he was on the boat, um, his teeth were knocked out uh, for them to force feed him cornmeal pack. And I mentioned, you know, all of the feces and stuff. His, his hair was saturated with urine and feces, and there were maggots and all of those things. And I find it very, very amazing that a lot of um, persons who read the book, they couldn't get through that part without crying and stuff, right? Um, also, when our own, you know, we, 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 we fled, when we were trying to escape, and they would hunt us with dogs and they brought us back and there were Sundays they would tie you on a tree and whatever. And some of the men were buggered in front of their, in front of their wives and their families. And you know, that would have definitely devastated the family structure as we know it as well. I wish we had more time because I wanted to talk to you about how you express the way black people view black women. Uh, if, you can, if you can just address that in 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Yes. Well, <laughs> there were bucks in the past and we focused and the bucks were actually, um, you know, highlighted. And we, 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 sort of, <laughs> we sort of adopted that, that, right, as black men. And we started then to treat the women, um, you know, without any level of respect or anything. And because Black men were actually torn away from the houses and never had any real role models or any of those things. Uh, we continue then to treat those women in that light. You know, I wish we had more time <laughs> to discuss it, but that is it. Rodney Lewis, author of Divided by Design. You've got to get a hold of this book if you haven't as yet. And you say it's only available in Barbados or can we get it on the internet? It's on Amazon as well. Definitely on Amazon. Wonderful. Yeah, okay, everyone, so um, make sure you get a copy of Rodney Lewis's book, Divided by Design. Rodney, great to have you on Brooklyn 45. Thank you so very much, Sam. Have a and, pleasure. Uh, we, we'll invite you again before your next birthday. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Okay.
And now over to Don Dre. Brooklyn 45 is a 501c3 not-for-profit, and we welcome your support. Check out our website, brooklyn45.com, and feel free to donate or share it with your friends and family. Have any comments or questions? Send them to our Facebook, facebook.com slash brooklyn45tv. If you have any questions or topics you think we should cover next, shoot me an email over at brooklyn45tv at gmail.com. Thank you again for watching.